Welcome to the Celebrating Women podcast, hosted by Mandy Montana, a podcast that celebrates women, their stories, their struggles, and ability to overcome. Conversations that celebrate their gifts, their talents, and courage. It's the Celebrating Women podcast, presented by Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler, Texas. Hey, it's Mandy Montana at Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler. You can give your skin the essential hydration it craves by moisturizing the Hand and Stone way. Chelsea Everett, the lead esthetician at the Tyler, Texas location, says keeping the skin moisturized stimulates skin barrier functions, which is crucial to the health of the skin. Chelsea, I know you've got three key tips on how to best take care of your skin daily. Do you want to give me those now? Three key things are keeping your skin moisturized, staying hydrated, and of course, wearing sunscreen. Moisturizing and especially hydration go together so well. You have to have that moisture barrier to hold that hydration in. Otherwise, you can drink gallons and gallons of water and it's just going to evaporate right out of the skin. Also, keeping the skin plump and slowing down the aging process a bit. But also, you know, wearing sunscreen. UV exposure is responsible for 80% of early facial aging signs. So it's crucial not only for preventative aging, but for preventative skin cancer. Chelsea, thank you so much for stopping by today. I just love your tips and I'm going to incorporate those into my daily routine. I so appreciate you stopping by today and for all of our friends that are listening. Remember, you can stop by Hand and Stone Tyler in the Cumberland Shopping Center to make your appointment or online at handandstonetyler.com. Welcome back to the Celebrating Women podcast. I'm Mandy Montana. And today I have my good friend Kelly Evanstein with me, which means we're talking books, specifically A Court of Thorns and Roses. So the last time Kelly was here with me, we were discussing Feyre Archeron, the main female character in A Court of Thorns and Roses. And before we dive into some of the other strong female characters in the series, which is our plan, we're going to do a quick recap on some of the qualities that we found in Feyre. So Kelly, what struck you um, what really stood out to you with Farah? So for me, the one word that just sort of encapsulates Farah is resilience. Because, yes, she was a very strong character. And we talked about, you know, her strength from childhood all the way through, you know, her whole story within this book. But the overarching theme for me was her resilience in no matter what was thrown at her, she found a way to overcome. Um, she found a way to, you know, find her inner strength. She found a way to, you know, overcome any obstacle that was thrown at her. I mean, we're talking physical torture, emotional abuse. Like there were so many things that were thrown at her, but she found a way through her inner strength and her strength of character to overcome all of those. So resilience is what comes to mind when I think of Farah. I totally agree with you on that. A word that kind of struck me and I felt like we repeated it a lot last episode was protector. Yes. Like to me, I feel like Farah is entirely resilient, but a lot of what's driving her is that desire to protect, whether it was her family, like her sisters and her father from Tamlin in the beginning or learning how to protect herself on her journey. And then later as high lady protecting, you know, her entire court and then the inner circle that she cl- so closely loves and admires as well. And You know, as we kind of got to the end of her story arc, as she was coming into her own power, another thing that really resonated with me was how love has pulled her through this, this series, this whole story. Absolutely. It's been centered in that with her love of her family and then romantic love and then, you know, friendship and camaraderie as well. It's just this overarching theme of love. Even when you go back to that riddle that Amarantha gave her, what that was how she freed people was literally by acknowledging love as the answer and the to the riddle of love. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, I think that us seeing those things in her, the resilience, the protection, the love, it, do, it, it kind of leads us nicely into, as we're looking at the other strong female characters in the book, starting with her sisters. Yeah, absolutely. Like her, her sisters and the relationship she has with her sisters is a very central part of her whole story um and since we're focusing on strong females I I feel like it's important that we acknowledge that her sisters Elaine and Nesta 
don't necessarily show the strength of character that Farrah does early on. Like, you know, we talked about most times characters come into their own. They come into their strength. And with Farrah, she was strong from the beginning. I mean, from age eight, she's she's sort of taken on the responsibility for her whole family, even though she's the youngest. So with her, it was it, she was she was strong from the very beginning. I feel like with the two sisters it's going to be a more gradual story arc to where they're not that strong in the beginning. But then as we move through the plot of the whole series, we will start to see how they come into their strength. Um, Especially with Elaine. Uh, Like I don't, Elaine is, is she is the bridge between Farah and Nesta, like she's the peacekeeper, she's the positive one, she's always, you know, happy, looks at everything through rose-colored glasses, you know, for the most part. But I feel like just from what we know about how Mass, Sergey Mass writes her books and, and, and th- that we will eventually see more from Elaine, I, I, I strongly feel like the next book in the series that has not come out yet, that has not been written yet, we don't know anything about yet, I feel like it's going to focus on Elaine and her story, and that's where we're going to see where she comes into her strength. I agree with you. I think that that's what we're going to see. And and she is a bridge and she's so nurturing. I mean, we see her tending gardens and wanting to grow things. And so I feel like that's kind of giving us a little a bit preview. of a glimpse and a preview of, of yeah. who she is. And then, you know, we learn in A Court of Wings and Ruin that after Elaine has turned Faye, that she has the gift of foresight and she has these visions. And especially early on, she doesn't understand them. I think she feels like she's crazy. Yes. And then as I don't remember who points it out to her, but once she recognizes that this could be a gift, she starts to embrace it. And because we're not inside Elaine's head in these books, we don't really know all of what's going on with her. But like you, I think that that's going to be revealed to us a little bit later. We do see a really strong moment from Elaine right at the end of Wings and Ruin, when Nesta is in danger, Nesta has decided to be brave and go fi- like lure the king of Hi- Hibern to um, an area away from the battlefield because she has taken a piece of the cauldron and she knows that she can be the bait. Cassian is with her. They're in a dangerous position with Hibern and out of nowhere, Asriel had given Elaine, truth teller, his dagger and as Nesta and Cassian are in danger, Elaine stabs Highburn in the back of the neck, which then allows Nesta to get up and behead him. The battle actually continues for quite a while after that, but we do see that they are the ones that actually killed the king, who is the villain in this this part of the series. Which, considering that he put them into the cauldron, the cauldron in the first place, with. it feels appropriate. Yeah, and they're very, very angry, which is what prompted them to step outside of their normal character to to do this and to attack him and to kill him because he's actually the one that killed their father. Mm -hmm. Um, They thought they lost their father. He comes back into their life as like the hero, which again... That's that's a rabbit hole. We're not going to go down. You need to read the books. Um, but they're very angry because the king of Hybern killed their father. So they are responsible for actually killing the king, which was the start of their victory in the battle overall. Um, so I think that's kind of where where they start coming into their strength a little bit more. Um, you know, Nesta. She's a little bit more interesting, and we have a little bit more insight into her because, of course, the last book is is from her point of view. So we have a little bit more insight into her and where she's going and where her character, you know, starts, the strength starts coming in, and she starts kind of realizing who she is um, because we have these, these, the, this book, and even in the, in the um, fourth novella. book, the novella, we see things from her point of view because the book is written from different people's different characters point of view so we have more of a of an idea of who nesta is as opposed to elaine and the thing with nesta is you know we talked about Farah's strength from an early age what drives nesta is 
anger. Like you just, she, because she's so mean and hateful. But when you really look at where that comes from, she is a very angry person. She, she lost her mother at a very pivotal age. She was 11 when their mother died. Um, she loved the, the wealthy, you know, background that they had. And when they lost that, she was very angry that that, that, that they lost all that wealth and that status. She was very angry at her father for not stepping up and taking care of them. She was very angry at her father for not using all of his resources to save their mother from the illness that she had. So, I mean, we just see so much anger from Nesta from all these circumstances that have in her mind I think all of these circumstances that have happened to her Mm -hmm. and she's very angry about it Mm -hmm. yeah and we could go on and on there's a lot of circumstances I mean Farah comes back and is like taken their house to meet with human queens to negotiate and then of course she's put into the cauldron by the king of Highburn and then her father who finally does come back is killed right before her eyes by the king and so yes she wants vengeance and I think you're right I think there's a lot of vengeance that's taken out on Hybern in that moment but then from there the trauma really starts to set in with Nesta and she starts exhibiting some really destructive behavior we see a small glimpse of it in a quarter of frost and starlight the little novella that's got the multiple POV but we really see it at the beginning of a court of silver flames yeah. where she is choosing to be very promiscuous. She's choosing not to live in the townhouse or with Feyre and Reese. She's choosing to live like in kind of a slum neighborhood and going to taverns constantly and just and drinking a lot. And she's weak and thin. And, you know, a lot of the things we saw in Pharaoh when she was dealing with her depression, we see some elements of that in Nesta as far as her physicality. She's just a lot more self-destructive than yes. Pharaoh was. Like Pharaoh yes. was depressed and, you know, she didn't eat and she was wasting away, but all of hers was sort of internal. Whereas Nesta was exhibiting very, very self-destructive behaviors with the, you know, the, all the men. And in public. And the, yes, very in public with all the men, the alcohol, the, just all of the things that she was using to numb. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things we learn about Nesta is that she feels things so deeply. And I think, you know, it, it all comes, we, talk, we talked about this and even Farrah, you know, talked about this. It all comes from a place of fear for Nesta. Mm-hmm. This, all of this, um, all of these deep feelings she has comes from a feeling of fear and and deep love. Like she loves so deeply that it almost has the reverse effect on on her behavior. And so I think that she's dealing with so much anger, so much guilt, so much, you know, all, all just all these negative emotions that are just festering inside her that it all comes out with the promiscuity because she's just in, in the, the alcohol and the, just all these things because she's trying to numb. Yeah, it's never stated that she's afraid of connection, but if you look at what happened to her when she was young, at the turning points that she had in losing her mom at 11 and losing the wealth and status and really losing her father in a lot of ways because he was mentally like not there. He was Checked not out. stepping up for his daughters. I mean, when you lose your parents like that at an early age, I could see how that could cause her to fear connecting because yeah. if she connects that deeply again, then will she lose them? And I think that's the it's point the where she's at. She It'll doesn't want to hurt. Yeah. And then it comes out as anger. Right. And so she's very angry at the beginning of this book and, you know, not to get too in the weeds on the plot point, but Feyre and Resand want to help her. Feyre more than Resand. He's pretty frustrated with her, but they, they kind of have a fairy intervention and they take her up to the house of wind where the only way she can get back down into the city where she's been exhibiting this behavior is to go down 10,000 steps 
and climb back up them or be flown in by one of the Illyrians that we mentioned from the last episode, Cassian or Asriel, because they have bat-like wings, so they have to fly her in. So she's... Which she hated because that was a loss of control. Right. Yes. So she's up in this house with these two guys that are basically her protectors, and they've given her two tasks, to train with Cassian, to get physically stronger, no drinking, eat healthier foods... That's the first task. And then the second task is to work in the library where the priestesses oversee um, beneath the House of Wind. It's kind of a safe haven for these priestesses that are really high regarded in Prithian. And specifically, these priestesses, we learn, have all experienced trauma, many of them some kind of assault or sexual assault. And this library has become a place of safety for them and a haven. And so Nesta is told to train in the morning with Cassian, the general of the army, and in the afternoon to serve and work with the high priestesses in the library. And she really resists the training in the beginning. But I think, you know, through through this forced, you know, um, intervention, I think this is where she really starts to come into her own. And it starts with developing friendships and learning to trust someone other than herself because I feel like she's she's very selfish she's very self-centered um and she she does not want to depend on anyone else and I think as she starts to develop a friendship with Gwen that's where we start to see her starting to come into her own um when she when she starts trusting Gwen becoming a friend with Gwen Um, She's also named the um, human emissary. Yeah, because Feyre is now a high lady, so she's she's no longer at that role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I I feel like, and and she also has a very um, love-hate relationship with Cassian. They're very sexually attracted to each other, but they hate each other. Like, it's a fun dynamic to watch between the two it's pretty spicy and but I feel like as she starts to develop relationships with other people that's where she starts finding a little bit more of her strength for sure you know I think too you mentioned Gwen I think she starts to feel protective of Gwen and I know I'm coming back to that word it was similar with Feyre but I think she wants she starts to see that she's wanting something for someone else other than herself because she's been in survival mode for a long, long time. And that's 11. Right. And so that is a really self-centered place to be. Then she starts feeling protective of Gwen because Gwen's got this boss that's a little bit difficult. And with Cassian, you know, she has to like give up control and she doesn't really like that because that's how she's survived all this time is to be in control. And what he's trying to teach her is that there's a different level of control when you surrender to learning how to strengthen yourself. Right. Yes. And like you said, there's, there is definitely some strong sexual tension. There's some great banter between the two of them. Yeah, they're pretty funny. And there's a real friendship, I think, that develops between them two. And they actually discuss it. Like at one point, he tells Nesta, I am your friend, Nesta. Like he wants her to understand. I've, or I think he said, I've always been your friend, mm-hmm. Nesta. And she's just never had that level of friendship. So I really find... Because she pushes everybody away. Right. And I really think that her strength is developed and, and she really heals. She begins to heal some of that deep trauma and hurt through those relationships. Through those relationships, yes. Yes. And so she's with got... Another, with another female yeah. that is very strong, Amory. She's she's a very minor character, but I love her. Because when you, when, you, when you read the book and you, and you learn about the Illyrians, they're, they're a very, very, very um, old-fashioned... Um, patriarchal patriarchal (laughs) yes um group and they are very women are less than and so they are treated less than they are maimed um their wings are maimed to keep them from flying especially the really old school you know Illyrian men they don't they don't want their women to even be able to fly so Emery is one of these whose father maimed her and she can't fly because her wings have been destroyed. And so, you know, Nesta meets her. They kind of come together to train together to fight, which is really interesting to me because they at the, they read about this group called the Valkyries, which I've... 
I mean, I've heard that term in other books that I've read, and it's a very, it's a group of very powerful female warriors. Yes, it's a mythological thing. Yes. That, I mean, you see it in the Marvel Universe. I know you've read about them in, in other books that you've read, but yes, strong, powerful female warriors. And Gwen begins reading about them, and this difficult boss that she has is actually writing a book about them, and Gwen's helping to translate it. So they get into the they get kind of into the nitty gritty of this as they they're training with Cassian and they bring to his attention that this is what they want to pursue. And he's like, Oh, I fought with the Valkyrie and they're all just blown away by that. Yes. And then he begins, okay, well we can, we can train in your way, which I love that about him. It's one of the things like, He's one of my favorite. I know. He's, he's one of my favorite Re- boyfriends. Resand, <laughs> Cassian and Azriel. What a, I love all three of them for different reasons, but yes. Cassian's funny. Yes, I love all three of them. Part of why I love them so much is because they do see women as equals. Yes, they want all of them women to pursue whatever they feel called to pursue. If that's fighting, great. If that's leading, great. If they want to have a family and that, whatever, they want women to feel that they have an equal role. And Cassian really, he doesn't he say no. He pushes them. But he doesn't say, no, you have to train like an Illyrian. You have to train the way I train. Instead, he says, give me the book. He then starts training as a Valkyrie himself before he trains them, then gives him the lessons. And when they start complaining that they don't want to do it, he's like, oh, no, girls. I already did it this morning. Like, there's just so much love about him. And I know we're spending a lot of time on Nesta. But I really think it's an interesting character arc because we do see her go from such depths of despair into friendship and healing. And then as she really steps into her strength, like we learn that her magic is really powerful and could be really dark. Thankfully, she is grounded in love because her magic appears to be death. And I will tell you, <clears throat> for a long time, I was very worried because she came across as a very dark character to me, like it's just so angry and just so mean and so hateful. And I was afraid that the darkness of her power was going to suck her under mm-hmm. and that, you know, but I, realizing that a lot of, of what was deepest inside her was such a deep love and that's where all the other stuff was coming from Mm -hmm. I think that is why her power the power of death became a positive like she used it in a positive way right and it really kind of go plays into how she is working as this human emissary because she's forced to talk. We mentioned the six human Queens in the previous episode, how they sort of were working, um, in and around this conflict with Highburn. And, and let's just point out real quick. Once again, Sarah J mass, right? Strong females. Like the whole human realm is, is led by women. Like all the, all the leaders are all women, all these queens. So mm-hmm. sorry, I interrupted. But no, no, no. That's, that, I mean, that's important to point out. Like these aren't; these are all women that are leading the whole human realm, right? And you know, these these queens vary in their goodness to evilness. And it, you know, initially, early in the plot, they were reluctant to help against Highburn, and then. A cup, some of them allied with Highburn, and really the reason that Nesta and Elaine were turned Fey was because it was a test to see if Highburn could turn Give the human immortality. queens immortality. And because Nesta took from the cauldron, one of the queens, the one that went in next, was turned into an old hag, and her beauty and youth were not preserved. And so this then creates anger from her, Brialen, and we see her show up trying to kill Nesta and she does it in a really strange convoluted way of pulling Nesta Emery and Gwen into the Illyrian blood rite and kind of while all of this is happening Nesta is also like having conversations alongside Cassian in a diplomatic way of the one of the good queens that had been turned into a fairy like a firebird she'd been cursed by a different character in this plot that 
you know, Nesta's going and using her wit and her cleverness and her diplomacy on the behalf of Resand and the Night Court alongside Cassian. And so, again, she, it's two women. It's two women negotiating this. And then it's a woman that throws her and Emery and Gwen into the Illyrian blood rite, which, aside from those three, is all male. Yes. And trained warriors that they fight to the death. We watched a funny video earlier where somebody compared it to the Hunger Games. Not unlike the Hunger Games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, because typically the Illyrian blood rite was, you know, like it's your wits and your wings are clipped and there's no magic. Well, Brialen planted weapons in there when she planted the girls in there. And it becomes kind of a, a really deadly, awful survival thing. And the girls have to fight their way to the top of this mountain. Yeah, they're trying, the, the Brialen's trying to give the males an edge to be able to kill these three women. And they had to use their strength and their wits and, and, and their... Um, the strong um, relationship that they had with each other in order to overcome. And, you know, in the end, it's Nesta's relationships that she's fighting for instead of fighting against. And I think that's the biggest transformation we see because she's fighting against relationships in the beginning. She doesn't want to be close to anyone. And then at the end, when she's facing Brie Allen, she is literally fighting for her friends and Cassian. So it's the strength of her relationships that is where her strength comes from. I think that's, that's, it's all about the relationships with her and, and her character arc as as, the stronger her relationships are developed, Mm -hmm. the stronger she is. And we see what a strong female character she is as her relationships grow. You know, another character in this series that I really love, and I really hope we get a book centered around her, too, later. I'm I'm ready for Elaine next, but I really want a book about Morrigan. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Resand is the High Lord of the Night Court, but his second in command and his third command are both women. Very strong women. Morrigan is his third in command, but she's also his cousin. And she's a very... Like, her story is very, very interesting because her father, she's, she, she's, she's got a really horrible father. And he basically wants to sell her to the son of another high lord for breeding, basically. Like, no respect for women. They mean nothing. They have no power. They have, they, they are good for nothing but bearing children. And he's trying to sell her and she decides to take it upon herself. She, she knows she's going to be sold. She wants to have the choice on who she loses her virginity to. She does not want that to be forced on her based on who her father is selling her to basically. So she makes the choice to lose her virginity to Cassian actually. Um, they, they, this was hundreds of years ago. They're now best friends, like more like brother and sister, but this is part of their past. So she makes the choice to give her virginity to Cassian, hoping that that will sort of nullify her dad selling her to this other guy. But when her father finds out that she's done this, he like beats her and throws her over into the autumn court because he was selling her to the son of the high lord of the autumn court and to is kind of an alliance to strengthen that relationship he throws her into that territory over the border with a note nailed nailed to her stomach basically saying she's yours now And so when the guy that she's been sold to, the son of the High Lord of the Autumn Court, sees her, he doesn't touch her. Like, he he just leaves her there. And she's found by Asriel um, and taken back, and, you know, she heals. And But what's so interesting is all of these awful things that have happened to her, she hasn't let that turn her into a bitter, um, angry person she's still she's very strong she is very much a leader she very much takes control um by being the third in command under resand she she basically is is sort of a boss to her own father so she faces him on a regular basis 
And like, she doesn't let any of her circumstances beat her. No. And she's so powerful too. Like not her strength of character and overcoming that. And Reese Sand had given her the opportunity, like at any time she can kill her father. Like he's given her that option. Like if it's ever too much and you want to end him, you have my permission. Yeah. But too, like her power is truth. Yes. You know, she is like the Morrigan again in mythology is a truth teller. They're able to see truth and understand truth. And so she really, I think, felt called to embody her own truth and not be trapped in someone else's by being given to Eris in that way. And I just, I find her really fascinating she's and very fun. very interesting, yes. And she's a little bit of a mystery to us. Sarah J. Mass has given us some glimpses, some moments from her perspective in Frost and Starlight. And so we know some things are happening. She's not very prominent in Silver Flames, but there have been some little like breadcrumbs, I feel like Easter eggs dropped throughout the series of more to come about more, I hope. Well, also that we do find out about her um, you know, through the, all the wars that, you know, happened hundreds of years ago, she is a bad ass warrior. Mm-hmm. Like she is one of the top warriors and she's very much respected by everyone. I mean, there's been stories told about her on the battlefield. So people have heard stories of her fighting in the original wars um, because she is a warrior. Like, yes. She is pretty powerful and strong, and she's just a very interesting character. Yes, and she stands up for herself, and even with Resand, like, she doesn't take anything off him, right? Like, he's her high lord, and she respects him, but she's also not afraid to go toe-to-toe with him and right. argue her mind. And I love, part of what I love about him, too, is that he allows it. And he listens. He listens. And he values what she has to say. Right. And two with Amran, you know, his second, I mean, Amran is, Amran and Moore don't always agree, which I think is really brilliant on Resan's part too, because you've got two strong females that sometimes disagree. So you've got an opportunity to really consider two sides of a situation before you make a decision as a leader. I think that's pretty brilliant leadership on his part. But Amran is, Amran is truly an enigma. We don't know what she is at the beginning of the book. She is a monster. There are stories that are told about her to frighten children. They think like that she's a myth, the human children and the fairy children until Lucian does until he meets her for one, but she's like got smoky eyes and she drinks blood. She doesn't eat real food and she's tiny. She's like this she's from another world. We know that Yes, we, learn we don't it. really know what she is. No, she's been around. She was in the prison before for- any of these people were even born. Right. So she knows the history of Prithian in depth, but she was trapped away in the prison for 15,000 years. So she missed a lot until she, the way that she escaped the prison, they do ask her at one point is that she trapped herself in this fey body so that she could leave now. And it limits her power. She still has power She's and we still see probably it more powerful than anyone else. Like the, the most powerful high Lord is Reese, but We don't know. Amran might eclipse his power, actually. So, But she respects him and follows him. Yes, she respects him as a leader. At at some point in the book, she talks about how she's never met a leader like him, a leader that dreams. And that's why she's chosen to follow him, despite the fact that she is so powerful, is she loves that he's a dreamer and that he has a vision for his people. For a better world not mm-hmm. he's not he's not about power he is no. about creating a better world for everyone right and so you know she during the war with hibern she sort of unleashes herself and we still don't know exactly what she is but she unleashes herself so that she can def- help defeat the hibern army and through that process, they think that they're going to lose her. They don't think that she's going to remember them, the inner circle, but she does. And she comes out of the cauldron and is reborn high fey and no longer has those destructive powers, but she's still powerful. She still has the wisdom, the history, the guidance to offer and the support. She's just a very, very intelligent woman who you know, just from her experience and her knowledge, 
is is great for mm-hmm. being just an advisor. Right. And we never, I don't think we see her fight like hand to hand fight, like a Lyrian training style, but I have a feeling she probably knows how to do it. Well, and the, the Fae body that she takes over is very small. Like it's, they refer to her as being very small, several, like, but everybody's afraid of her. Even the though tiny she's monster. This, this, yeah. <laughs> even though she's this little bitty thing, um, everyone's afraid of her. Yes. So you mentioned that Amran is is a powerful advisor. There are some other powerful advisors in Prithian, the high priestesses. Yes. And we see them in various places. They're all over the island of Prithian and on the continent. They're very highly regarded as advisors to the high lord. So they have a lot of power. Right. If you think like Catholic priests, that's what they kind of remind me. Except again, it's a matriarchy. They're females. Yes. And so we see them... Um, under in the library under the house of wind we mentioned them earlier but there are also high priestesses in the various courts and the one that we that we learn the most about outside of the library is ianthe we see her in the spring court as she is serving or manipulating tamlin yes she comes into the picture after the curse is broken and they had been friends before the curse but after the she she was sent off so the curse didn't affect her so after the curse is broken and she comes back and and becomes the the top advisor like the main person that tamlin listens to and she the the whole time is manipulating him because through this 50 year curse when she's off she allies herself with the king of highburn so she comes in and starts working to try to create an alliance between tamlin and the king of highburn so she's working that end of things to try to get tamlin to aid the king of highburn into taking over prithian but when we first see her, she's really giving a lot of guidance to Feyre as to what she needs to do as the consort if she's to marry Tamlin. So who she would be as not a high lady, but as like a um, the lady of the spring court is who she would have become if she had married Basically Tamlin. a trophy wife. Yes. And so that's what Ianthea is teaching her to do, to be small and to hide her power and to be subservient to Tamlin and all of this. So we see her in that way, but we also see her flirting with Lucian. And we don't really know to what level until later. As Feyre is training with Resand, at one point, he's trying to get her to, to take on another magical task to learn. And he bargains with her that if she completes the task, he will tell her about Ianthe because he's kind of let it slip that he knew her. And then he begins to tell his story of how actually he shows Feyre mind to mind, his memory of Ianthe attempting to seduce him. And it's vulgar. And Reese wants nothing to do with her and promptly turns her away. But she continues to try to seduce him and gain his power because that's what she's after. And not just him. She has a history of sexually assaulting others. Like that's, that's the way she tries to control and manipulate men is through, you know, just sexual harassment and seduction. And that's, that's how she tries to use her power. And we see it later with Lucian when Pharaoh returns to the spring court and she's spying. And then we see it again Later, even when, even after after Ianthe is killed, Feyre is imitating Ianthe when she goes into Highburn to retrieve Elaine. And when she does, one of the characters that she interacts with, Jurian, is reminding Feyre to be seductive to him because he's that's like, what they're used to. Yes, that's if she's going to pull off this, you know, this ruse that she's Ianthe, then she's got to be seductive and you know, like touching him and, you know, begging him to be, you know, intimate with her kind of. And it's, it's just, I found it to be really disgusting. Well, and you know, we were, this whole podcast is talking about strong female characters, but we have to point out that just because, I mean, we have some strong characters, but they're strong in a negative way. Right. Because this is not a heroine in this story. She is very much one of the 
one of the bad guys in this story. But but we still have to point out that even like she's typically, you know, you're you have a hero and you have a villain. Whereas in Sarah J. Mass universe, we, we focus on heroines and villainesses. <laughs> like, yeah, even the villains are, are women, and Ianthe is one of those. Another one of those villains who has a lot of power is Amarantha. Yes, and speaking of sexual assault, my Ooh, goodness. Yes. That's why I mean, Rhysand is known as her whore. Right. For 50 years, he's trapped under the mountain And part of the reason that he submits to this on a regular basis is because he feels that he's protecting his court. He was able to wipe the minds with his magic of everyone under the mountain while he was down there under her, her reign. And so no one knew of his inner circle. They didn't know of Valaris, his protected city and so the whole time he's down there for 50 years trapped under this mountain he's submitted to servicing her is the way he puts it on a regular basis and pleasing her in a way that makes her believe that he is her puppet and that he is her toy and that he is you know has submitted to her right and it's just it it makes me so sick whenever I think about it but again not a positive strong female, but Amarantha is the main villain in that first book. And we learn that she is the top general in Hybern's army. And when she had first come over, she was there to like broker peace. And, you know, for, I think for 50 years prior to the curse, she was there trying to manipulate the high Lords into believing that she was their friend. They started to believe it Tamlin was actually the one holding out, which is how he ended up cursed. Um, But it's, again, you know, a strong, dynamic female character, even if a negative one. Yeah, she, she, she was something else. Like, she was very evil. And, but everyone bowed down to her because she they were so afraid of her well and when she cursed them she took the high lord's power we mentioned that you know before in when we were going through Feyre's story but one of the things that i find interesting about the whole series kelly and you and i've talked about this quite a bit is it's not just the prominent characters in this book that are strong females there are strong females all over the pages in small areas yeah like Anytime there's a, a another, a, 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 I wouldn't even call them a minor character. They're just a blip. Like, they're just a mention. But they're always female. Like, when Feyre is trying to save the arts district when they're being attacked, the only one that comes out to help her is a female that owns an art gallery. Like, that's the only one. And she comes out. She has no power. She's standing there with a pipe, you know, with all of these horrible creatures demons demons attacking them but she is the only one brave enough to come out and help Feyre fight yeah and early in the series in the very beginning when Feyre is like selling her wolf pelt and to the deer she finds a mercenary that is a a woman yes I mean and then in Valaris they all go to this one restaurant it's their hangout place and the owner is a woman woman. like and Rita's the other bar that they frequent owned by a woman every (laughs) every kind of way that Sarah J Mass can um put a a female in there in sort of a leadership role or a role of strength or a role of bravery or a role of, you know, anything that um, raises them up, she does. I mean, she takes every advantage to promote women in in her writing. I love it. I love it. And, you know, again, Kelly and I started reading Sarah J. Mass's books with A Court of Thorns and Roses, which is why we started talking about the strong female characters in these books. But the next series that we're going to get into is maybe even a stronger main female character. We're going to get into her series that is, it starts with Throne of Glass. And it is the first series that she wrote. She started writing this series at age 16. So just for a little bit of that context, blows my mind. I know just for a little bit of context, as we kind of go through this, if you're reading along with this, or if you've read 
A Court of Thorns and Roses, and you're thinking about joining us for the next bit, the age that Sarah J. Mass is, is when she is writing these books, I feel like influences the level of romance that she includes. Yeah. So the, the A Court of Thorns and Roses series, Akatar, these books are much more adult. And you notice that even from the beginning of Akatar to Silver Flames with Nesta because her tone shifts. Yes, And very the much. theme becomes much more adult. And there's much more language. And steam. And steam in the later books. Well, as we shift back to Throne of Glass, it's, we're going the opposite direction. She's a much younger writer. She's dealing with teenage themes early in these books. But again, she grows up as she's writing these books. By the time she writes the final book in the series, Kingdom of Ash, she's very much a mature adult. And the tone begins to grow with her as well. And the steam grows with her as well. It's so, like you can watch her growth and maturity as you read the characters growth and maturity because very there, so. there's very much a parallel there yes yeah, so that's a lot of fun and she's written these these books these series kind of in tandem with each other so if you ever want to go back and look you could easily google that to see like what her release dates were but she had written quite a few of the throne of glass series before she started a court of thorns and roses and then began releasing them like for a while she was releasing two books a year so one from each series Mm -hmm. and then we bring in crescent city (laughs) yes so we've got all these worlds and there's some crossover, so you might want to keep listening to us because we might get into some of the crossover stuff. That's right. So we're, this will all start to develop over the next few months as we kind of are wrapping up Akatar. We may reference the characters again as we kind of continue talking about the world of Sarah J. Mass for sure. But look forward next time to Throne of Glass next month. So if you want to read along, start with that one. Some people will tell you to read Assassin's Blade first. It is a novella. I strongly suggest reading Throne of Glass, Crown of Midnight, then read Assassin's Blade before you move on to the next book in the series. But we appreciate you listening. We hope that you're enjoying this series on strong female characters on the Celebrating Women podcast. And again, we would love to hear from you. So if you have thoughts, send us a voicemail to celebratingwomenpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to feature you alongside our comments. The Celebrating Women Podcast wants to hear from you. Email us a voice message to celebratingwomenpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear your story or the story of an incredible woman you know. Become part of the conversation on social media. Facebook.com slash Celebrating Women Podcast. On Instagram, search Celebrating Women Podcast. The Celebrating Women podcast has been presented by Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler, Texas. Book your appointment today. Stop by the spa in Cumberland Shopping Center or online at handandstonetyler.com. Support the show for as little as $3 per month at celebratingwomenpodcast.buzzsprout.com or visit our show notes. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to the Celebrating Women podcast. Hey guys, it's Mandy. Have you been struggling to lose those extra pounds? I know I have totally been there. An extra, you know, 15 to 20 pounds can totally creep up on you in perimenopause, or at least it has with me. And I think I found it early. I hope it's not happening to you. But if it is, I've got the solution. You can lose up to 15 pounds in eight days with an incredible product line that I found and I want to share with you. Get a custom product recommendation with a complimentary wellness screening in the show notes. Just click Zing with Mandy.